welcome back to this screen to uh, this journey, this encounter really with um, the Bodhicharya Avatara, this, this, this text from the eighth century written by a poet, scholar, monk called Shantideva. And what we're looking at as, as, as we encounter this text is, is a kind of a manual, a very short book. I mean, this is probably the thinnest version of it. That's Stephen Batchelor's translation, and uh, there's not much introductory material in it. So, you know, there is some and some notes at the end, but this is a small book. It's a small text. It's a short text, but it is, you could say, a comprehensive introduction to the spiritual life. Well, more than an introduction, it's a comprehensive guide, almost a manual of the spiritual life, particularly from the standpoint of the Mahayana. Um, the, the, that, that sort of dimension of the Buddhist tradition that was particularly concerned with the altruistic dimension of things and the very, very sublime sort of philosophical, metaphysical take on the nature of reality in terms of shunyata. And uh, this text is, it's poetic, it's practical, it's sometimes highly philosophical and metaphysical, and it's sometimes deeply and beautifully, wonderfully inspirational, and sometimes it's scorchingly challenging. Uh, and he can flow between those different moods and stances. You know, he can turn, he can turn on, on a rupee. Uh, he, he's a very, very adept, almost gymnastic manipulator of, of our states of mind. As he guides us through the entire book, through a kind of meditation. It, in some ways, you can take the whole book as a, as a meditative journey through the spiritual life. And in particular, um, you can take the chapters that we're dealing with today, chapters two and three, very definitely as, as a guided meditation where he brings all his psychological astuteness and brilliance to the task of, of guiding us through a series of moods and uh, attitudes from almost a standing start to the taking of the Bodhisattva vow. So last time, just, just, just to say very briefly, um, because I think it's important to set the scene, not just to kind of refresh your memory, but because chapter two follows on absolutely directly from where we've got to in chapter one. Chapter one is, um, what I described last time as, as a sort of sales pitch for the spiritual life. It starts with a kind of really straightforward question, you could say, here you are by some extraordinary fluke, you're alive, you know, the big bang has ended up with you here having a life of 70, 80, 90 or so years in, in the middle of eternity, and what are you going to do with it? What's it for? What's the purpose of it? What are you for? Uh, reminded of a friend of mine who was on a tram in Amsterdam with her son. And at some point she turned to, he turned to his mother and just said very loudly, mummy, what's daddy for? Uh, well, and that's a long story, but we won't go there. But we could all ask ourselves sometimes, you know, what are we for? Why are we here? Shanti Davis suggests that kind of distinct from animals who are just here and they don't ask such questions. They just eat grass, they suffer, they don't suffer, they stand in rain, they stand in sun, and life just goes by. Um, we human beings, as well as being kind of self-conscious about what's going on around us, also are visited by moments, by flashes, um, where for some reason, and maybe we don't even know why or how it happens, we, it's as if we're visited from something beyond ourselves. It might just be in, um, you know, somebody somebody on the street is, is just asking for money, a busker, and instead of putting in a 10p piece, you just sudden something in you makes you want to put a fiver in. Uh, or it may be that you give up your place in a queue for someone else, or it could be something really small but just something happens, which maybe takes us by surprise. You know, may, maybe not where we kind of ask, where did that come from? You know, like a flash of lightning, Shanti Davis says, goodness appears in the world. And um, 
I mean, my favorite memory associated with that, which I've told a couple of times before, but maybe not with anyone here, I don't know. Um, I was very fortunate when I was, I think, probably 16, something like that, Martin Luther King came to London and gave, and gave a talk. I think it was the only time he came. And I was there. And uh, the talk, I hardly remember, to be honest. It's been overlaid by more famous talks that he gave. But after he'd spoken, Canon Collins, who was the, he was the apparagator of the evening, he was the host, um, gave a, a, an appeal for money to help uh, Martin Luther King's work. And he did this extraordinary presentation about, uh, he just challenged the audience. He said, you know, you've probably already decided how much you're gonna give, because you know what you do in these situations. Well, I, I just want to invite you to double it. And then he said, um, you know, it's not much, is it? Even though you've doubled it, it's not really very much. And people laughed. And he said, why don't you double it again? And people laughed. And then he did it again. He didn't told to double it again. And then there followed for about 10 minutes afterwards, people circulating in the halls. And every now and then he would announce that he'd just received a check for a thousand pounds or 5,000 pounds or 10,000 pounds. And people were cheering. It was like, there was a frenzy of generosity that just took over the room, you know, whether hundreds of people. And this absolutely sort of unprecedented, I'd never seen anything quite like it, just a, a few hundred people just glorifying in the possibility of being insanely generous to an extent they'd never experienced or expected of themselves before. And it was really wonderful and it was memorable and it kind of illustrates that we have that capacity too and what Shanti Deva suggests in in the first uh, chapter is that that those moments those flashes of lightning are saying something really important you know that we humans have this capacity and if we can recognize the depth of the origin and the significance of the origin of those moments. And if we choose, we can devote our lives to deepening it and, and fulfilling it and making that uh, the kind of force that, that motivates us through our lives. And it's a force which is, as we experience maybe even in those flashes, it's something we're doing, but somehow it's as if we're not doing it, as if we've just tuned in to a potential. Of, of the human condition, of the, of the human state that, that's quite beyond us, uh, in which we can feel as if we're merely participating. That, that's his sale pitch. And he goes on to say that if, if you can devote your life to that, not only will you be happier, but you will be able to bring about ha happiness you know, for, for others. And that what you'll discover is that uh, the immersion in that state, which can only come about through work and through the emergence of, of insight. It's not a willful effort. And this is something that uh, is kind of quite important to grasp uh, as he kind of demonstrates in that first chapter. You know, that the kind of insights that fill out those flashes, that make those flashes more and more and more the kind of motive facing, uh, motivating force in our lives is profoundly transformative, bringing about our happiness washing away even or at least having a, a huge effect on whatever you know evil karma we may have built up but uh, but above all bringing about the welfare of the world in in ways that seem really quite mysterious so this is where he goes on uh, in, in chapter one he just spins in a way that the, the dream of a transformative experience rooted in something that's fundamentally organically human but which is radically transformative and which places us in a position to be of incalculable benefit to others as our sense of self is not so much lessened as, uh, and as Banti would like to say, it's more expanded, you know, that our sense of self just starts to include as it kind of gets attenuated in terms of our own experience, it, it becomes more and more inclusive of, of others as our, our, our entire relationship with the rest of reality is transformed. So that's kind of where he left us at the end of uh, 
chapter one. You know, it's a it's an incredibly inspiring piece of writing, um, almost entirely wholeheartedly positive, and just building up a case that kind of leaves our head spinning at the end, in a mood of uh, of inspiration. Maybe kind of with a little bit of a koan, because the 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 vision he weaves of of a bodhisattva, because that's what we're talking about. You know, somebody whose entire life energies ultimately, uh, through the arising of the bodhicitta, this spirit that, that that I was talking about, this motivating spirit, this almost impersonal, suprapersonal, uh, motivating spirit emerges in us. It is so sort of profoundly altruistic that if you're not careful, you can be you can feel crushed by it. But if you get what he's saying, you know, if you get it that this is the kind of person you'll become when these insights have have flowered in you, when they've deepened in you, it's not that you personally will save everyone in the world, but your mind will be such that whatever you do will be motivated by. You know, wanting to reach out, wanting to help, wanting, if necessary, where possible, to to save even people, mainly from themselves. But what now? You know, being in this this mood of inspiration, having taken him, you know, taken him on, taking Shantideva on, believing him that there is this possibility sort of sewn into the jewel, sewn in, into our garment, so to speak, with this possibility of the emergence of, of bodhicitta, the, uh, the perfectly awakened mind, uh, as, as one translator has it. What, what do we do? We're inspired. Thank you very much. You know, it's, it makes some sense. Thank you. I want it, you know, but, but what happens? Where do we go from, from there? Well, you know, that, that's what the rest of his manual is about. Uh, he takes us through, in his own way, the kind of the journey of, of the Bodhisattva's practice of perfections, of morality, generosity, patience, uh, and, um, patience, virya, um, energy directed towards the good, meditation and, and, and wisdom, and so on. He takes us through, through those stages in his manual, but, but first he kind of sets us on the path, and it's a path that's going to take, well, I was going to say a lifetime, but it's a it's a path that's going to take lifetimes in, in through through his perspective, through a Mahayana perspective, but to kind of set us on our way, and as a kind of ongoing boost to our motivation and and our attitude, he he offers a practice, and it it, it it's called in his. Here's some, a term you're familiar with, uh, the sevenfold puja, uh, the sevenfold worship. It's, a, it, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, it, it, it's a guided meditation practice that spans two chapters of his book, of his manual, where he introduces us stage by stage to a series of moods or a series of, of attitudes. Uh, an attitude of simple worship, respect, devotion towards the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, a mood of, of prostration, of salutation, of reverence, a mood of going for refuge, the mood of commitment, the mood of confession, the mood of rejoicing in merits, the mood of entreaty and supplication, and the mood of transference of merit and, and self-surrender. So I imagine, I know my impression is that the Sevenfold Puja isn't done quite as much as it used to be at, at our centers, but I imagine you've all, you're all familiar with the Sevenfold Puja. Well, the Puja that you're familiar with, that Sevenfold Puja is um, a kind of very, very truncated, a very highly edited down version of, a translation of the text that was 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 done long before there was any published translation. I think a, a friend of Bantis or a connect a contact of Bantis, Mrs. Bennett, translated some of the Bodhicharya Avatara, and uh, when Banti composed a, 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 po a puja for us to use at our centres and on our retreats, he took this translation and just took some verses from it. 
But if you read Shanti Deva's translation, if you read if you read the manual, you'll find these seven moods in, in, in much longer form. Not all of them. Some some, some of the, the, the moods are as short in, in Shanti Deva's original as they are in our you know, regular sevenfold puja, but some of them are much, much longer. What Shanti Deva is offering us is a kind of practice that we can use as a, as a sort of constant companion to, to generate and consolidate our aspiration, um, to really help us to direct and engage our, our emotions in the business of, of transformation. Because even if you know, the, the becoming a bodhisattva, becoming someone whose entire life energies are directed towards the welfare of others, even, even if, as I said, this is something that is kind of all organically potential in all of us human beings and can only be fulfilled, not through willful effort, but by, by the emergence of, of insight, nevertheless, um, it's going to take effort. It is going to take the exercise of the will on a day-to-day -day level as we do the work involved in transforming ourselves. I imagine that's no surprise to anyone who's been involved in, in the Dharma for any length of time. Sometimes things unfold very naturally with no effort, but uh, you know, also it, it very little is likely to happen if we don't make some effort at some time. So what, what uh, Shanti Deva is offering is, is this puja that puts us in touch with these moods in a way that at times inspires us and at times challenges us in, in ways that help us to engage our emotions or even sometimes could, you could say drag those emotions out of us so that we're almost left with, with, with no alternative but, but to follow him as he leads us progressively through, through these moods. It is a journey. Um, you know, there are some lists in, in the Buddhist world, and there are many, many lists in the Buddhist world, which are progressive, which are kind of, uh, they can be laid out in a progressive way, because, well, you have to write one, one word after another, uh, but which can all be practiced at the same time. Well, the, the, you know, the, these moods, these attitudes that Shantideva is, is, is pointing to in his Sevenfold Puja are standalone moods, standalone attitudes. They're all spiritually valuable, efficacious, and so on. But the way he lays out his Sevenfold Puja, the way he construct, constructs it is very much as a sort of, as a flow. We kind of enter it at the beginning and he just draws us in and one thing organically emerges out of another one mood you know it organically emerges out of the preceding one so he takes us you know along a river as it were flowing from a mood of, of reverence to finally the mood of transference of merit and self-surrender in a way um the, the sevenfold puja, the structure of the sevenfold puja, perhaps echoes uh, the path that, that we inevitably follow if, if, if we progress along the spiritual path. Um, it includes ups and downs. It, it, it's, not, it's not just one simple journey from better to better to better, from happier to happier to happier. He, as, as I said earlier, he can switch moods very, very quickly. Uh, and have us sometimes you know, glorifying in, in, in beauty in the next minutes and plunged into the depths. I'm going to protect you a little bit from some of the depths today, but, but, but not too much. You may wonder, I, I, I've talked about it as a guided meditation. You know, most of us are familiar with it as a collective ritual, something we do at the end of, a, of, of an evening at a centre or at the end of a day on retreat. And uh, we're kind of used to doing it in call and response in company with others. But if you've been on a, on a solitary retreat, even doing our sevenfold puja alone, either in your mind, out for a walk or in front of your shrine or, or aloud, um, it, it, it's, a, you know, it, it's also a very, very effective practice to do 
alone. And I guess the way I'm talking about it today is more as a meditation. Um, reading something that, that, that Banti wrote, I think, so, yeah, I think it was in the Endlessly Fascinating, fascinating Cry, the, the transcript of his seminar on this text. Um, he makes a strong case for, for really doing it as much as you can as a collective ritual. I'd add as well. Uh, the point he makes is that because the nature of bodhicitta, the nature of this spirit that we're trying to connect is, if you like, transpersonal. It's not, it's not my spirit. Being a bodhisattva isn't my attainment. Um, just as he's said, uh, that the bodhicitta is more likely to arise in a community of people working together on some altruistic project than in an individual, in the same way he quite likes the idea that a collective puja done in call and response, in, in company, it, it is a lovely echo of, of that teaching, you know, that, that, that we, we, we don't have to think of kind of making my bodhicitta arise. It's more a matter of making myself available to the bodhicitta, um, whether in some more general way or whether in, in relation to the people I'm doing it with. So we're gonna make a start uh, on the, the text itself. And I want to start with the first section of the puja. And I'm going to read a lot of not the whole chapter, but I'm going to read the sort of the first verses, the mood of worship in Shanti Devas, from Shanti Devas text. So I'm going to read it kind of slowly with pauses, so you can kind of take it as a meditation. Um, I've been reading all, I've got about five or six translations here. And in the end, I've fallen back on Stephen Batchelor's. I think probably because it's the one I'm most familiar with and at home with. Um, yeah, so it's following up on, on the puja, really. And you, you mentioned that the puja, uh, the sevenfold puja that we have, was assembled by Bante using verses from the Bodhicharya Avatara. Yeah. I wonder if you know anything more about why he decided to draw from that particular text uh, and, you know, what was in his mind when he was thinking about creating a puja? Because obviously there's a lot of other traditional pujas and materials around. Okay. Um, okay, well, I, I, I'll answer it fairly briefly. As I said, I said last time, um, I guess the reasons are along to the lines why he decided to run a study seminar on the Bodhicharya Vatara as the very first study seminar he ever, he ever ran through the 1970s, I guess, mainly, yes, starting with the Bodhicharya Vatara in, I think, 1973, he, uh, he ran for about 10 years, I mean, a regular program of study seminars. I can't remember how many a year, but, you know, whether it's seven or eight, maybe, 10-day study seminars, weekend study seminars. The very first one he chose was the Bodhicharya Vatara. And I think he... I think he wanted at that stage to, 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 to put into the air the, the Bodhisattva ideal. I think he wanted to put Shanti Deva into the air. I think uh, it was something he felt very strongly for. And I think at that stage, which um, as I mentioned last time was only two or three months before the first order convention, where about 24, 20, 24 of us sat around the walls of a room while Banti spanned the, the vision of a movement um, <laughs> that he had in mind. Um, I mean, he definitely was, was launching, if you like, the, 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 the order as a, as, a bo as a bodhisattva in his way. And I think the, 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 for, for that reason, the bodhicharya avatara was very important to him and, and set the mood. And I will assume, I've never heard, you know, it'd be interesting to, to find out if anyone knows better than I do, but it seemed to be in harmony with that, that he definitely wanted to inject that dimension in, in, into, into our bloodstream. I mean, of course, he wrote this, the short puja some years later. Um, I remember sitting at the dinner table with him trying to work out what we, could, what we should call it. 
<laughs> I think I can't remember whether it was short or threefold. I think it's both in most people's minds. But yeah, it is interesting. But I, I, I think that Banti did want at that stage to inject that kind of challenge, that 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 visionary challenge of the Bodhisattva spirit in, into into us from from the beginning. And of course, in the days when we had one class a week in a hide room, and that was Tri Ratna. Um, even then, that's what we were doing, you know, and he was in, in subliminally kind of planting that seed of, um, you know, the Bodhisattva vision in, into, into our minds and hearts. I think that's the best I can offer at the moment. So if you'd like to just um, ease yourself into a kind of slightly more meditative stance, you know, maybe just, you know, you might even want to adjust your posture. And I've gone into the first chapter, you know, I spent time just reminding you or telling you what happened in the first chapter, partly to kind of begin to set the context out of which it's, um, out of which it's uh, all these words that we're about to uh, hear have emerged. So as I say, I'm, it's not just that I'm going to read it slowly, I'm, I'm going to read it leaving pauses so that you can just let the words, the images sink in. Okay, so, in order to seize that precious mind, I offer now to the Tathagatas, to the sacred Dharma, the stainless jewel, and to the sons of Buddha, the oceans of excellence, whatever flowers and fruits there are, and whatever kinds of medicine, whatever jewels exist in this world, and whatever clean, refreshing waters. So don't let, don't be afraid to let your mind just sort of bring these images into your mind. Something familiar, somewhere you've been, somewhere you haven't been, just allow yourself to play with the images. I'm just going to give you a little bit of time occasionally to just be somewhere in, this, in these places. Likewise, gem-encrusted mountains, forest groves, quiet and joyful places, heavenly trees bedecked with flowers, and trees with fruit-laden branches. Fragrances of the celestial realms, incense, wishing trees and jewel trees, uncultivated harvests and all ornaments that are worthy to be offered. Lakes and pools adorned with lotuses and the beautiful cry of wild geese everything unowned within the limitless spheres of space. Creating these things in my mind, 
I offer them to the supreme beings, the Buddhas, as well as their sons. O oh, compassionate ones, think kindly of me and accept these offerings of mine. Oh, protectors, you who think of helping others, by your power, accept these for my sake. Eternally shall I offer all my bodies to the conquerors and their sons. Please accept me, you supreme heroes. Respectfully shall I be your subject. Through being completely under your care, I shall benefit all with no fears of conditioned existence. I shall perfectly transcend my previous evils and in the future shall commit no more. to very sweetly scented bathing chambers with brilliantly sparkling crystal floors and exquisite pillars ablaze with gems, having canopies above aglow with pearls, I beseech the Tathagatas and their sons to come and bathe their bodies from many jeweled vases filled with waters, scented and enticing to the accompaniment of music and song. Let me dry their bodies with incomparable cloths, clean and well anointed with scent. And then may I present these holy beings with fragrant garments of suitable colours. I adorn with manifold ornaments and various raiments, fine and smooth, the Aryas Samantabhadra, Manjagosha, Avalokiteshvara, and all the others. Just like polishing pure, refined gold, do I anoint the Buddha's forms that blaze with light, with the choicest perfumes, whose fragrance permeates a thousand million worlds. And to the highest objects of giving, I offer beautiful, well-arranged garlands, as well as enchanting, sweet-smelling flowers, such as lily, jasmine, and lotus blooms. Also, I send forth clouds of incense whose sweet aroma steals away the mind, as well as celestial delicacies, including a variety of foods and drinks. I offer them jeweled lamps arranged on golden lotus buds. Upon land sprinkled with scented water do I scatter delicate flower petals.
to those who have the nature of compassion. I offer palaces resounding with melodious hymns, exquisitely illuminated by hanging pearls and gems that adorn the infinities of space. Eternally shall I offer to all the Buddhas jeweled umbrellas with golden handles and exquisite ornaments embellishing the rims, standing erect, their shapes beautiful to behold. And in addition, may a mass of offerings resounding with sweet and pleasing music, like clouds that appease the mis misery of all, each remain for as long as necessary. And may a continuous rain of flowers and precious gems descend upon the reliquaries and the statues and upon all the jewels of Dharma. In the same way as Manjagosha and others have made offerings to the conquerors, similarly do I bestow gifts upon the Tathagatas, the protectors, their heirs, and all. I glorify the oceans of excellence with limitless verses of harmonious praise. May these clouds of gentle eulogy constantly ascend to their present presence. And just for a few minutes, just sitting with those images, or maybe just one or two of them, and just allowing your mind to, to kind of rest in that universe, maybe just some part of it, maybe something very elaborate, or maybe some very simple image. See if you can yourself sense the immediacy of the Buddha's and Bodhisattva's presence.
Okay, so just in your own, when your own time, just sort of coming back into the room, back into our connection. So I'll just say a few words and just make a few points about um, those verses and, and, and then sort of open up to hear if there's any comments anybody would, 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 not, would want to make or a question you'd like to ask. But um, I think what, what, what I really appreciate in what Shanti Dave is doing in those verses, you know, I don't know if you notice uh, straight away, but he kind of begins um, just in nature. You know, lakes, forests, the cry of wild geese. It's not, uh, he's not pushing it. He's, you know, the jewel, um, the jewel umbrellas haven't appeared yet, nor for that matter have the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. He's just taking us, you know, by the hand and saying, just think of a place. Just think of a place that you love, that uh, you visited, somewhere beautiful, something you're familiar with, but when you're there, you're uplifted, you're inspired. You know, you're, you already start to feel yourself being drawn towards a, just a, a different way of being to maybe your, your humdrum everyday life. And then gradually by stages, he, he introduces, you know, slightly richer imagery. He starts to invite us to go from an imaginative memory, you know, a memory of a beautiful place, a memory of things close to our experience, which is starting to fire that part of the mind that sees things, that remembers, that visualizes, and, and just draws us deeper into a more mythic, more imaginative, more magical realm. And into that realm, in that realm, we meet the, the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. And so, you know, th th there's this kind of way in which, you know, you could say that the, these early verses are like the Samatha practice, you know, where we're refreshing and calming and, uh, enriching our ordinary mundane consciousness so that it's kind of ready to, to meet the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. It's ready to, um, to, to see them, to, to, to see them perhaps, you know, as, as they are uh, you know, in, in, their ideal, in their ideal form. So it's enlightenment clothed. Because in chapter one, you know, there, there's talk of the awakening mind, there's talk of bodhicitta, there's talk of this potential. You know, there, there's talk of the bodhisattva, but the bodhisattva more as a sort of potential. You know, here in, in this chapter, through this, this imaginative journey, he, he, he begins to take us on. He takes us into a world where we meet that ideal, that idealism that he spun in chapter one in the form of Buddhas and bodhisattvas who, who we meet in, in, in this world. And having met them, there's a kind of an, an initial response of, of wonder of wanting to make offerings, wanting to make a declaration to them, you know, a kind of sketchy, almost outline of a declaration, de a de um, declaration, I'll, I'll surrender myself to you. You know, I'm going to make myself a, a servant of your, of your will. And then as if to consolidate it and push it further, Shanti Deva invites us in imagination to take them to bathing chambers, to scent them, to anoint them, to clothe them. And, um, I don't know whether people find that sort of thing fanciful, um, embarrassing even. Um, I remember a, a particular puja, an Amitabha puja that, that, that I've done, um, where, where you do a lot of this with, with Amitabha and the text actually keeps saying, you know, every time you, you dry him or clothe him or um, Put perfume on him. The text says, of course, he doesn't need this. He's already gone. He's already perfect. He's already you know, whatever. I need this. And it's by imaginatively doing this that I'm purifying, I'm scenting, I'm clothing my inner vision. You know, in other words, you know, we're, we're engaging in what Jung would call active imagination and, and, and kind of moving ourselves through, through this kind of 
meditation, in, into communication. We're not just feeling some vague idea of an ideal or not even just seeing it in some idealized form out there, but through, through, that, through that practice that, that Shantideva invites us into in imagination, it's like we're in communication with the Buddha. In other words, we're in communication with, in a way, what it's drawing, what the practice is drawing out of us, our, our most refined um, aesthetic possibility, our, our, our own refined imagination, our own idea, in other words, of what that ideal might look like, feel like, talk like, be like. You know, we're in the presence of, of the Buddhas. We're in the presence of, of our, our own ideals. And in a way, um, the, this act of, of coming into communication into contact with the Buddha is, should should ideally you know inform the rest of the practice the rest of uh, you know, uh, of the journey through through the stages of the puja that the whole thing is is a kind of a, an offering to the Buddha uh, recited in the presence of the Buddhas and, and Bodhisattvas so that's kind of what's going on there this is this is Shantideva kind of using that skill of his you know, to, to, to take for this, 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 this idea of this world of ideas that he spun in the first chapter in, into something that we feel, but we feel at the highest level and not only feel it, but feel in touch with it, in, in some kind of connection with it as, as we start to connect with what's, what's in ourselves through the, the medium of, of projecting it onto the imagined Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. So I'll pause in case someone wants to ask something or indicate Aparajitra or, or look out for, for hands or semaphore signals. Or... Tony, was that you? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> reaching for his cup. Caitlin, Caitlin raised her hand. Hi, Caitlin. Thanks, Nagabodi. Um, yeah, I was just wondering if you could say a bit more maybe about the um, the use of the word, word evil and why Bante chose to, to keep that in our puja, given the kind of provocative connotations with uh, Western minds. Okay, well, um, I think the, um, I mean, it might be better to go into this a little bit later when we come to the section on confession, but never mind, actually. I, I, this is quite interesting reading Marion Matic's um, introduction to his translation, which was the translation Sanger actually used when he studied it in 1973. Um, I think the translator was very aware of that, and most translators are aware of that, of that problem that we have these days with, with, with those sorts of words. But... Um, what we're what we're what we're working with is i guess it's twofold i don't think buddhism pretends that people don't do desperately bad things i don't think i think i think that is a fact that buddhism is prepared to face and sometimes as, as marian Matix, the translator said yeah we do have to use that word because the strength of the sanskrit word evil is the best shot we've got at putting that across but it, it, it's twofold you know, people do do evil things. You know, there is, if you like, evil in the world. You could say, in this, you know, whether you want to see that through a religious, you know, uh, perspective or just, you know, there are things that just defy d defy understanding. You know, that, 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 that they are so bad. But also, when we're turning on us, and um, when we're looking at ourselves, you know, we can give ourselves a very hard time. And you know, this is what we'll we'll work with a little bit when we come to the section on confession. We we can have an idea of ourselves as being evil, which is, if you like, counterproductive. You know, when when we feel very guilty with something, we can have a very very low opinion of ourselves. We can lose any sense of self worth and think of ourselves as being you know, dreadfully evil. And again, it's just the psychological reality that Shanti Deva is. Um, is flagging. I mean, I, I'll talk about it a bit more in a while, but um, yeah, I think I'd rather I'd rather go into a little bit more, you know, when, when, when we when we address it through 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 the section on on confession. But I think 
yeah, I'd see, you know, my, 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 my sort of, my answer here would be one, the translate, three, one, the translators seem to think it's a good word for the Sanskrit equivalent, papa, yeah, I think is the, trans, the Sanskrit word, two, um, yeah, there, there, there is, you know, there is stuff that's so bad that to just, it, you might as well not beat about the bush. And then thirdly, there is the way we can think of ourselves when we're overwhelmed with um, self-doubt, total loss of spiritual confidence, where we can just think of ourselves as being wretched and worthless. So I'd say th th those would be why, why the words left there. I think you might find other translations beat about the bush. And unfortunately, so those trans, you know, there are, if you like, more, I don't want to say politically correct, there are more contemporary translations, let's say, around. But sometimes the way they beat around the bush, I think you might as well just stick with someone who's Stephen Thank you. Batchelor. This is I'm, I'm reading from Stephen Batchelor's translation, and Stephen's um he's very able to be politically correct if he wants to, but he obviously chose to uh, use the word evil. Lovely. Thank you very much. Yeah. Was that Vimla Chitta? Yeah. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Uh, yeah, no, I was surprised actually that. In a way, I found the archaicness of the language quite difficult to to make the leap to connect with. I think I'm more used to doing other kinds of pujas or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, I felt my sort of contemporary self slightly distancing itself from lots of things that are just so not not contemporary, you know, the the even the words of these sort of Buddhas floating about with their sons and, uh, uh, you know, the whole idea of kind of subjugation and washing things. I, I kind of wanted to connect, but I felt like my contemporary self somehow yeah. going, what? <laughs> you know, what? So I wonder how, uh, you know, one, um, how, how to make the, the the jump somehow. I know what it's trying to do, but yeah. it was somehow like the language and the images seemed distant and I couldn't quite, uh, I couldn't quite touch it or something. Sure, sure. Um, I mean, when, when I've been on or when I've run study seminars, you know, for a week or 10 days or whatever on the text, you know, I, I, I I think it's quite natural to spend quite a lot of time on day one warning people of all the things you're going to bump into. <laughs> the fact that Shantideva is a, a very uncompromising monk and uh, you know has all sorts of attitudes that we might find sort of difficult to, to swallow. And yeah, the, the, the ornateness of uh, eighth century Sanskrit poetry and, and that world, that, the cosmology, the, the imagery and so on. So in a way, the short answer is, um, you know, we're going to need our own pujas. Mm. You know, our, even our own sevenfold pujas doing this job, but 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 uh, in in, yes. in in a way that that is more suitable to our kind of Western sensibility, but which has the same effect. I mean, yes. I I did wonder about leaving out, as even as I was reading the umbrella verse. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. Probably very few of us get off on, you know, umbrellas with jeweled rims and all the rest of it. You know, it's a, uh, but it's kind of there. It's part of the package. And I think my only, my, <laughs> my quickest answer is deal with it. <laughs> you know, this is eighth century Sanskrit poetry, and this is the world we're entering. And I think, you know, I, I guess what I'm doing is, is, is as, as, as well as I can in a very short amount of time, offering an introduction to, to a text, but it's also inevitably a bit of an introduction to a world. And it's a really good question to ask. Mm -hmm. How do we, you know, how do we make use of that? You could say that about Mahi, or pretty much any Mahayana Sutra, mm -hmm. um, you know, or, 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 or tantric work, you know, we're, we're entering strange foreign mythical worlds and i and i think you know the, which is why i think it's worth putting in those pauses i mean sometimes if i'm on a retreat just leading this the ordinary tree around the sevenfold puja i quite like to leave a break between every verse 
of a few minutes for people to find their own way in you know to, to that mood you know there's there's these hints from the text you know flowers incense you know what what can i imagine offering you know what what is the what's the what's the place that i would like to meet a buddha in and 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 so on and i think you know that, that you know, if there was more time and i'm very aware i'm introducing seven verses you know in, in two and a half hours um you know it would be really good and it'd be really interesting to sort of look at other ways of doing it and to and to have the time to say well look, these verses are a guide they're a kind of serving suggestion but you know with with you know, in, in sadhanas, you know, I think, you know, there, there are quite a lot of these images which we meet in, in, in our visualization practices or in, you know, the tanka behind me, you know, you know Amitabha there is surrounded by, you know, devas and darkies and, and umbrellas. There are umbrellas, you know, and, and peacocks and, and all the rest. I mean, we, we, we can, you know, we, with practice and with familiarity, these things can take on their life and, as I said, this is a meditation and you can't be expected to just get into it, you know, immediately. But I guess I'm doing my best, you know, to convince even my wife that it's worth doing. <laughs> Tony. Hello, my dear. Um, just on that one, I actually found the umbrella is probably one of the best bits for me. Uh, and that's that's well, how it goes. Would. You would if you could zoom out and see the room you're in. Oh yeah, I know, yeah. I know. I live in I live in that universe, and I was going to sort of go on to that really because at the moment I'm finding a lot of my visual imagery apart from around me from from films, mm. um, and I'm just working through the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and having yeah I know, but having just yeah, watched no, Doctor Strange for you. <laughs> having, oh no, well that's good, but having just watched Doctor Strange, it's like which starts in Kathmandu, of course. Yeah. He, he goes on this real trip man and it's 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 a bit like that it's about stretching your mind and you know i mean i i totally get what vimla chitta says you know it's finding one's own um resonances with the imagery and making it work for yourself yeah. but uh, i mean there's just so much out there that's that's not just so so boring and as you were describing it you know with, with the umbrellas i could just see these jewels twinkling around yeah so that that was that. That wasn't actually what I was going to ask. It's just a more practical question because um, okay. you talked about the translations and you've chosen Bachelor, which which surprised me a little because I missed you reading the line about the endlessly fascinating cry of wild geese. We just got these beautiful geese. I thought that's a bit dull, but I mean that's my conditioning. Um, but you mentioned last time there are about seven translations now, and I just wonder why you've chosen this one tonight. You know, and what the others are. are. Yeah. Well, what I've got on my desk is Cros uh, Skilton and Crosby, yeah. uh, the Padmakara translation group, which I think they come out of the Vajradhatu world. This is Marion Maddox. This is the one that Vanti led study That's from. Right. Which was know, yeah. Yeah. In his day, it was the only published translation. And then this one, which is from Tarpa Kel Kelsang Gelso and his and his crew, the NKT people, and then Stevens, Stephen Bachelors. Um, Stephen Bachelors was like the the one, the first one that appeared after Marian Maddox, and it's it was very obviously done by a Buddhist. Right. And I mean, I you know that was really what was around for a very long time. And although choosing over the last few days which translation to use at the last minute literally Vimala Chitta will attest to it I I plumped for Stephen Batchelor partly out of familiarity and partly because some of his terms of phrase yes at the loss of the endlessly fascinating cry of wild geese you know appealed to me more than um, more, more than the others that's great yeah I was I, just I, curious yeah, yeah I was on a conference in in the, in, in America in 1987 I, with with a lot of Buddhists, including Buddhist scholars, and uh, many of whom in those days then were young and have gone on to become quite well known Buddhist scholars. But I I asked them why was there only Stephen Batchelor's uh, translation? I think we had that by then. Yes. Um, why 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 had all these? Why has nobody done the Bodhicharya And they said almost all of them had tried. And they said this, the Sanskrit, you know, it's poetry and it gets more and more and more complex. 
as it goes along. So a lot of translators start, they roll up their sleeves and say, right, I'll show the world, and then gave up. It was a translator's graveyard, and it was years before then, you know, some, old, some better, some other translations came. But I, I still like, I, there's something about Stephen's translation which I like. Right, okay, thanks for that. So, yeah. Better move on, and I, I want to just point to something that happens because, in a, in a way, <laughs> this addresses, in a way, Vimala Chitta's sort of question: when it's working, when it's working. Uh, I don't know if anybody noticed this, but it, it's it's common to all translations. I, I've checked them, all the ones I've got here. There's a slight shift in 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 the rhetoric. The the the, the text as I read it, you know. It's I do this, I do this, I think of you know, birds, I bring to mind Buddhas, I bathe them, I wash them. Then um, it slightly shifts. It goes and says, it goes on to say, in addition, may a mass of offerings resounding with sweet and pleasing music, like clouds that appease the misery of all, each remain for as long as necessary, and may a continuous rain of flowers and precious gems descend upon the reliquaries and the statues and upon all the jewels of the Dharma. So, you know, I don't know if anybody noticed that slight shift in the rhetoric from I, I, I to it's as if the practice has taken its own life. I'm no longer doing it. I'm no longer exercising my imagination to imagine I'm bathing a Buddha or creating or offering flowers it's now just happening i am in that place with the buddha you know the buddha you know my, my connection with the buddha has started to become so real i'm in the presence which is you know in, in a sadhana practice that's whether or not you visualize well you know what matters is you know am i did i have even for a moment a sense of being in the presence of a buddha you know, or even a host of Buddhas and, and Bodhisattvas. And that's what Shantideva is sort of, that's where he's kind of hinting, you know, by this point, you know, maybe not on your first reading of the text, but, you know, if you're sort of following this journey from the familiar to the magical to the, to the Buddhas, if you really engage in it at some point, it will have its own life. You won't be doing it anymore. You will be there. They will be there for you. And in that mood, of course, when that happens, well, what happens? You know, you are in the presence of a Buddha. And, you know, I don't know that there are people here who've done pujas or done visualization practice. You might feel, you know, at those moments in your practice, whether it's in a puja or during a sadhana practice, you just find yourself sort of, making that gesture just acknowledging that you're in the presence you know the mood of salutation when it's working when the puja is working for you the, the mood of salutation you know just spontaneously emerges you know you you are you can't do anything but just say you know you're, you're aware of them you're aware that uh, they represent something magical that in relation to them you are you're just you. But it's a very spontaneous feeling. That's what Shantideva is suggesting the mood of salutation is. It's not, you know, these people are bigger and better than you, so, you know, you should, you know, should be um, humble in relation to them. If, if, it's, if it's working, if the puja is working for you, at that moment, the mood, the mood of salutation just is, is an impulse. You know, it's a, re, it's a positive reaction. To, to, to the encounter, a felt you know, sense of the presence of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. And so with bodies as numerous as all the atoms within the universe, I prostrate to all Buddhas of the three times, to the Dharma and the Supreme Community. Likewise, I prostrate to all reliquaries, to the basis of an awakening mind, to all learned abbots and masters, and to all the noble practitioners. Now in this translation, I, I, I like this translation because it really does spell out something kind of really important that's going on in these verses. This isn't just a few lines of, of, of if you like, mere salutation, you know, it's sort of just one, you know, just wonderful to see the Buddhas. I salute the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. No, and it's not just 
that it's saluting the three jewels, the Buddhas, the Dharma, and the Supreme Community. It goes on that, likewise, I prostrate to all reliquaries. The word is taichas or chaichas, reliquaries, stupas, the, the burial mounds of, of, of bodhisattvas, of, of Buddhist saints. In other words, all this stuff that he was telling you about in chapter one, all this idealized encounter with the ideal, with the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas in imagination, he suddenly goes wham and look around you. There are tombs. There are places where they've been. This isn't just a dream. These people have walked the earth. This is history. It's possible. It can be done. Not only that, they've left teachings. There's a tradition. There's two and a half thousand years of accumulated wisdom that's come out of this ideal world, out of this experience. And it's available through teachers, through abbots and masters. And not only that, but there are also noble practitioners. There are people doing it. In other words, <laughs> this means you. It's, it's not just something to live with as an idea, as a dream. As, as a sort of uh, a nice religious sort of um, buzz. But all these things that we've been working to kind of connect with through chapter one and chapter two, it all lands here with, in, with this mood of salutation. It's not just paying reverence, it's, it's paying reverence, you know, in a way that makes us realize this, this affects me, I'm, I'm part of this, or I could be. And of course, the natural reflex is to, you know, if we really are inspired, if we really are engaged, if it's really working, then the mood that naturally follows is, well, all right then, you know, I'm up for it, you know, I'll do it, you know, I will, I will go for refuge. Yeah, and so, so, so that's again where we've been brought to, to a recognition that this is something that can be lived, it can be embodied, and there's no reason why I shouldn't be, include myself in, in the story, you know, because there are, there, there are teachers and there are people who've been doing it and, and still are doing it, who will be companions, who will be support, who will be teachers, and so on. So that's... That's where we've been brought to by by these uh, by this these first three these first two moods of worship and, and salutation into the mood of of going for refuge. So it'd be a good a good moment to to pause, you know, for any 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 other comments or questions. This is a bit of a weak and warble <laughs> comment, really. Um, I get the urge to physically express you know it comes up over and over again and I sometimes you know this is why it's a bit weak and weevil because I feel embarrassed right I, I think people think must think I'm kind of over the top um yeah you know pious um I'm sorry because I know the one needs to be an individual and it doesn't matter what people you know people think you know don't like me because of too much prostration or whatever <laughs> but I'm still you know I'm, I'm still on that edge of oh it, 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 this is what it, it, in a, in a center situation you mean in, in a puja or uh, yeah. just, just to get the picture of what you're what just I really wanted to and then you said oh this is about salutation and it was like yes of course I'm wanting to do this mm. I wouldn't let myself because everybody might think oh god you know she's being easy <laughs> oh well I, I would hope I would hope not I I, I mean gosh yeah I, I I'd really hope that uh, unless you know I mean are you talking about in a in a, in a center or on a retreat or a it's kind of right here, particularly because you know on the screen, everybody mm. you. Whereas in a, you know, in, in a shrine room, 
you know, not mm. always looking forward sort of thing. So yeah, yeah. Quite... Oh, well, look, you're you're among friends here, Liz. You know, it's really don't, don't... <laughs> and we we are different. You know, I mean, I I I, I know what you mean, but I I, I would. I was, I, I, the reason how I got into Tri Ratna you know, in the Stone Age was because I was working with a Buddhist who was extraordinarily devotional and gushing and the way he talked about it, you know, did, you know, I was one of those people who could be put off by that. But I think as soon as I got involved, you know, I realized I'm in a world where I, as well as other people, am allowed to express that and find, discover that in myself. I wish, I wish there was more of it in me. I envy you, to be honest. Um, I, I, really, I really don't think, uh, you know, basically see what happens if you do it. You might have a surprise. And if there, and if people, you know, I would hope, you no, know, I would hope, sort of, you know, that it's, it's, it's a groundless, you know, a, a groundless sort of fear, but I think you, you know. I think if you can just sort of easily and wholeheartedly experience, you know, feelings of devotion, of, of salutation, of obeisance, of, of that sort of thing, it's you know, it, it directed towards you know the right objects. I think well, Sadhu, well, well done you. you know, it is. You know, it's um, there's something you know. I, I don't want you to be. Um, you know, I'm going to, I'm, I'm about to sort of read something from Sangharachita where he talks a little bit about the difference between um, devotion and commitment, which is, which is important to, 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 to take in, but that's in no way to say that devotion is any cause for embarrassment or, or anything else. I, I just think um, my sense of, of, of Banti himself, you know, was, although there was something about him that was really cool by, by way of personality, but you could tell the way he talked about his life in India and his world that, you know, he, he was a very, you know, he had a very strong devotional streak. And certainly people I know who I really respect and admire have very strong devotional streaks. We don't all, you know, like we don't all have images and things popping up in our meditation every every day but you know we our temperaments differ but i think good for you yeah thank you it's just more courage is needed i think isn't it yeah yeah well i i look you know you'll and you'll probably be doing everyone around you a favor i don't know whether in mexico it's uh, that's ever an issue not priya well, uh, I, I was just listening carefully and I was actually delighted to hear those <laughs> comments, you know, about devotion. And I was thinking, oh, um, you know, are we a bit embarrassed about that? And uh, I was thinking about uh, how people often come to the center and greet me. And quite often, this is Mexican people, if they don't know me, they will bow. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's quite a bit more familiar to me, that kind of, uh, that way of interacting. Yeah. And I definitely encourage you to express it, Liz, uh, as much as you like. I was in, um, in 1982, I traveled with Bandhi in India while he gave talks in about 30 towns in Maharashtra and Gujarat. Um, and one morning, a, a member of the order, Maha came came to, to came to meet us. We, we were sitting in an outdoor cafe where well, you can hardly call that in India it was just a it was just a, t a tea place with some canvas over, over the top and Banti and I were sort of having tea and Mahadamavir ke came along the um the street and it was a very busy crowded Indian small town Indian street and he saw Banti sitting there having a cup of tea and you know, all these people walking around him and tuk-tuks going by <laughs> Mahadamavi just threw himself down on the ground and did a full prostration in front of Banti. No embarrassment whatsoever. You know, no. So yeah, I mean, a, a little bit of that. But something, just to kind of um, put something out, that Banti did want to make the point when talking about, um, you know, that transition from salutation to going for refuge, that you know, there is devo you know, devotion can lead to 
going for refuge you know and that that's what that's the journey that's the trajectory that shanti deva takes on that this build up of idealism and devotion takes form in in, in the act of going for refuge but um Banti says, after you've done all your elaborate ritual worship and bathed and decorated and fed all those images, the greatest expression of your devotion is when you simply say, Budhang Sarananga Chami, Dhamang Sarananga Chami, Sanghang Sarananga Chami. It all culminates there. If you make all these wonderful and glorious offerings and decorate the shrine, and raise canopies and scatter jewels, but then don't end up by going for refuge. It's all somewhat abortive. You can have a wonderful and glorious time making offerings, but you may still stop short of actually going for refuge, which means, which means you aren't committed. But if you're genuinely committing yourself, don't worry too much, or even at all, if you experience any difficulties about making offerings because you've done the main thing, you've gone for refuge. So, you know, it takes all sorts, you know, and, and some of us are more devotional than others and have an, a, a kind of a much kind of smoother devotional reflex. But the, the point Kanti makes there is that the culmination of devotion is, is, is in the act of going for refuge, you know, the acts of body, speech and mind, the life that, that, that comes out of. Your, your commitment to, to following and, and embodying the ideals of, of Buddhism. I mean, I, it seems relevant to me to, 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 to just um, remember something that happened in 1972 on a retreat in Keffold. I mean, up to then, you know, we were all you know, 19, 20, 21, 22, young. Probably most of us still stoned half the time. <laughs> Um, between going to these classes with Sangharachita and, and so on. And for my, the first year I was involved from 72 through 70, 71, you could, um, in a question and answer session, you could throw anything at Banti. And every other week in this hide room or when we got it at Pundarika, he would turn your ridiculous, vague, half-baked question into a masterpiece of perfectly crafted prose, expressive, you know, everything he knew about the Dharma. It was magical, miraculous to behold, and so generous because he never said, well, what do you mean? You know, I don't understand the terms of your question, or if you mean this, then it's that. Never. It was just, he treated us, I guess, like the kids we were. But then in 1972, on this summer retreat at Keffel, something happened. He just started to keep talking about how unmindful we were, imposing lots of silences. And in the question and answers, would give very short answers or, or would sort of challenge the, 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 the way the question was phrased. And I rather tentatively said, could you... Um, Banti, could you say something about the idea of going for refuge? And he, there was a little pause and he said, it's not an idea, it's an act. And that was all he'd say. Um, you know, there, there is, and I think, you know, he was, he really did want us to be more devotional and he wanted us to be aware that there was, you know, that one leads to the other. Um, and in a way, devotion can be an expression of going for refuge. Or it can be, yes, it, it, it can, you know, it can, it can stop there. So it's just, you know, it's an interesting point that he raised, but it seemed at the time, it's kind of interesting that he felt the need to make that point. You know, and, and I, I don't know quite why. It was partly in relation to ordination, that people, there were people who were very loyal and very devoted and couldn't understand why he wouldn't uh, ordain them. And so he was taught that day, he was talking in, in, in those terms. But yes, you know, it's it, 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 to the extent that he absolutely championed puja. He absolutely championed uh, the Bodhicharavatara. He absolutely is, you know, is was up for us getting into jeweled umbrellas and or whatever it took to 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 uncover, to find our own imaginative, our own creative imagination, our own creative imaginative relationship with the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. 
as, as, a, as a very, very necessary stepping stone through emotional engagement to, well, what going for refuge is going to, to, to mean for us. I think this would be a good place to pause. Um, we have ahead of us confession and, um, and then what follows. So there's quite a lot to cover, but I'm going to suggest, I think it'd be nice for you to have some space. So I'm going to suggest that we go into breakout rooms um, for let's say quarter of an hour. And it's going to just be three people in each room. And I was thinking that an idea for the breakout room would be to, you know, you might just want to talk about whether, yeah, dual umbrellas will work for you, but in what way are the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas alive in your life? To what extent, you know, do you feel that you have access to an experience of, of the presence of the Buddhas? Welcome back. We, uh, Aparajita and I exchanged chats briefly during the break I said really we should have put a made this a day event he wrote back and said yeah we need a week actually we need probably a year <laughs> to do injustice <laughs> it's it does feel a little bit brutal to uh, to be moving so quickly and this section on confession that we're about to bump into of course is one that's um um, I can remember being involved in Mitra study groups years ago, which, you know, where we would be, we'd be on confession if we went through the Bodhicharavatara. We'd be, we'd be on the confession se section for months or uh, going open retreats where people were introduced to the puja and having to have special groups the next few days to, to discuss why we have the confession. Oh dear, then I really need to do something in a few minutes. So, remember the whole, the whole journey has been very carefully and cleverly constructed by Shantideva, one thing leading to another. So worship leads to salutation, salutation lands with going for refuge and going for refuge, you know, which Sangrachita says is this culmination, the culmination of our devotion. But it's a little bit like, um, I guess, you know, learning something like judo or karate. Uh, you think you think it's about getting a black belt, and then when you get a black belt, you realise you've just started, which is um, very much also the case with ordination. If anyone thinks that ordination is in any any kind of end to anything except wondering what ordination is like, um, you'll know that it's kind of you know it's it's just another beginning. And so, and so, in this text of going for refuge, the the the, the, um, the reflex here of uh, of going for refuge is, uh, yeah, is is this mood of confession. And if I don't know if that seems odd to anyone or, or paradoxical, but it feels very natural to me. Just a really simple memory, which um, well, it's not even a memory. When I go on retreat, you know, when I meditate for any sort of length of time, at any depth, I will have my squirrel day. And the squirrel day is a day in which my meditation is constantly um, um, invaded by memory of when I was about 13 and uh, I shot a squirrel with an air gun. You know, and it was, you know, inefficient and, you know, it's, you know, it's a nasty memory. And I was a kid, you know, in a way, I, but it's there, you know, it's like when my, it's as if when, when my consciousness and my moral barometer or compass reaches a particular point of refinement, outpours things, you know, outpours that memory, you know, the more I, the, the more in touch we are with our commitment, the more in touch we are with our refined sensibilities, you know, what we activate through, through the acts of going for refuge, just the words in themselves, you know, innocent enough, but 
when we act on, on the basis of our going for refuge, we act in our mind, we act with our body, we act with our speech, you know, our, our, ethical, you know, our ethical mind, our imaginative mind reaches a point of refinement where we become aware of things that we lack, that, that aren't ready, that aren't in tune with our going for refuge. I mean, you think of Megia seeing that mango grove, you know, a, a perfect place for a son of good family to strive. You know, look at it, beautiful, lovely day, shady mango tree. And he gets completely invaded by thoughts, harmful, um, lustful and, and malicious. And, you know, in, in our ways, um, I'd be very surprised if you know, our, our, our gathering sensitivity and sensibility that we've acquired through life or just in the context of a retreat or even a single meditation triggers among other things and sometimes quite overwhelmingly a feeling of inadequacy a feeling of doubt even you know a feeling of wickedness even you know a memory of something that's profoundly embarrassing even something we're deeply ashamed of that that wells up you know at least at that moment you might think about it two hours later and think why was i so upset about that you know and yet, you know, in that meditation, in that moment, when your sensitivity was that refined and tuned in to your, to your aspiration, it, it was, it did hurt. It really did hurt. So I think this is where we, you know, we, we come to, 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 to the evil, that we have this intense sense as a reflex of our going for refuge at times, at times, I'm talking about at times, you know, of... You know, the gulf between you know, what we're aspiring towards and where we're at as we, as we make contact with the nature of our, our conditioned habitual being and yeah, maybe memories and tendencies that we really know are in the way or that, that are still there, still latent in our memory and our consciousness to trip us up and, and undermine our efforts, even so, so doubts. And this is perfectly natural and I'm not sure... Yeah, you know, I don't know. I don't know if it ends. I imagine it does. I hope it does. But I'm, I'm certainly still susceptible, you know, to that sort of thing. And I've spoken to several people and who, at least the first time they conducted an ordination, a private ordination, spent the hours before the ordination reliving everything in their life that made them unworthy to conduct that ordination. Um, you know, I went through an agonizing time on the retreat center just outside Sydney before I ordained, um, um, you know, you don't need to know who. <laughs> but the poor man shouldn't know. But, you know, I spent that afternoon, Buddha Dust and I assembled a shrine. We turned this room in, 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 in one of the cabins into a lovely shrine room, meditated together, and he went off. because, And I just descended into the worst self-doubt that I'd ever experienced. It all went swimmingly. And uh, the order member concerned has done very well for himself. But these things happen. So just as there's the impulse to confer to um to to to, 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 to perform salutation you know, from, from, from the, the, the mood of worship, you know, that there might be this impulse to confess at least when we're in the presence of the Buddhas, or even if there isn't an impulse to, to confess to the Buddhas, seeing a Buddha image, you know, being on retreat, seeing a Buddha image, it just might strike you as an interesting thing to try or a worthwhile gesture to make, you know, even quite quietly for yourself. And the great thing about a Buddha is a Buddha only feels compassion. Buddhas are perfectly familiar with the idea that although we want happiness, we run headlong into the causes of suffering. You know, we're not going to surprise a Buddha. We're not going to shock a Buddha. And, you know, whether you like it or not, a Buddha can't grant absolution. A Buddha just hears our confession, receives our confession, and receives it you know, with interest, maybe, with curiosity, maybe, but with nothing but, but love. And to, to express those feelings of self-doubt, of self-blame, and so on, in the presence of someone who, through our imaginative connection, which, remember, we've been building up through this puja, we're actually in touch with. 
you know, from whom we are experiencing rays of grace, of, of, of love, of encouragement, is just an interesting thing to do. It won't necessarily make us feel better in some, some obvious way, but it will transform things in, in some way. And, and above all, it means even to be doing it, whatever the outcome of, of, of having that mood of confession, of being in touch with ourselves, being in touch with our past, our tendencies, our habits, our self-doubts, you know, in that thoroughly positive context, you know, it's a very good way of bringing just a bit more of ourselves to the party. You know, in other words, you know, it's a very integrative thing to do. You know, we might have work to do. Um, there are stories in, 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 the, in the various canons. You know, Milarepa performed murders and nevertheless gained enlightenment in one lifetime. Um, and Gulimala, I can't remember at what point, but he certainly, I think, at least attained stream entry eventually. Devadatta, who tried to kill the Buddha, has been predicted to enlightenment. I don't think he's gained it yet. He has been predicted to enlightenment. Um, but, you know, a really important part of the path is to, to, to bring the whole of ourselves to things. We, there's no room really to, to hide from ourselves in a Dharma context. But the wonderful thing about a Dharma context is that it's, you know, it's not... Um, you know, it, it, it's not a context that's going to condemn us. Our actions, you know, might weigh heavily on us. You know, we, we can't get away from our karma, but we can, you know, we can lighten the load uh, by just psychologically, by making a clean breast uh, of what's on our mind to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. I haven't yet talked about confessing in a human context, uh, but that might be for another time. But also even the very act of bringing ourselves to a place through meditation where we are in real felt imaginative contact with the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas or just one Buddha or just one Bodhisattva or even your teacher in your imagination is in itself a karma producing action. And you know, the tradition has it that you know, there, we can we can do things to rebalance our karmic load. You know, it's it, it's a, maybe it's a niche interest. You know, I don't know. There'll be people here who are probably very familiar with this, but we can we can do sort of counteractive. We can build counteractive practice uh, karma through our practice. So we might have very weighty karma from our past, which won't go away, but we can at least counterbalance it. And whether or not you believe in that sort of thing, at least there's the psychological lightness that can come from making a confession. Certainly, you know, to, to, to Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, but, you know, and there's no time to go into, you know, in, into confessing in, a, in, in, in the context of a, an order chapter or a going for refuge group or, or, or so on. That's a whole other thing. I mean, I wish there was time, but as I'm sure you're aware, it's an enormous subject on which Bhante has spoken. There's a great lecture to listen to, the, the spiritual significance of confession. Many order members have talked about um, confession, so there are talks on free Buddhist audio if you want to follow this up. Um, what I do want to read is, is something very interesting that, that, that Bhante said when talking about this on, on, on his seminar. Talking about con confession and karma. He said, it's not, of course, that sins are wiped out on the level of sins or karma abolished on the level of karma. But when you confess your sins and bring them out into the open, you confess them to and bring them out before a Buddha or Bodhisattva. And if you do this sincerely on that particular wavelength, the fact that you are in touch with that different dimension, as it were, has its effect even on the karmic level. It's not that the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas save you from the consequences of your acts, but because, because in the midst of it all, you're in touch with those higher spiritual forces, it has a different meaning. The experience in a way is the same, but the meaning of the experience is different. 
this kind of ties in with um, um it kind of ties in with with, with something you know, something that some people are doing it's you know in our world it's often called the reaction practice it's very similar to you know the um the acronym rain that you'll find in other contexts of uh, um you know when um i'm just trying to my mind's gone senile um Tara Park. what's that Tara Park. Yeah, Tara yeah, Park yeah. And, and others. I've, I'm just having a senior moment, but let's just say that um, in this practice, you know, you, you've got something, you know, you've got something on your mind, you're, you're suffering, things are difficult, but if you can just pause and just allow yourself to experience, you know, what, what, what's going on and just recognize that this is just your share of the human condition. This is reality grating on your self nature on on your sense of separation this is the inevitable discomfort of thinking of yourself experiencing yourself as a separate to the rest of reality if you can just hold that view and just live with that and just allow yourself to experience it it's as if a kind of interest develops a curiosity develops and even a sort of uh, I think Sabuti in something he said, a kind of almost a wry amusement, uh, and just, just a slight sort of interest and amused interest in the phenomenon takes over from what might have been beforehand you know, a, a, a level of suffering. But even to be with, um, even merely without going into the stages, which I can't remember of the uh, RAIN or the reactive practice, um, you know, as it's taught, just to be with 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 difficult feelings, you know, whether they're you know, whatever they are, and particularly feelings of guilt, just to allow yourself to experience them and to experience them fully in the body, you know, has has the effect of transforming them or elevating the the nature of the experience. You know, something that um, I've been trying to tune into Damarati's uh, work that he's doing at the moment on um, the Anapanasati and Satipatthana suttas and uh, something that he quoted was it was something that Prakasha had said uh, which is that feelings want to be experienced and uh, Vimala Chitta might remember the actual full part of the set the second half of the quote. I think it's something like if you fully experiencing if you fully experience them they are transformed is it or yeah, I think he even says they're blissful. I think he might have even said they're blissful. Yes, um, that's it. Yeah. yeah, and I think we're in that kind of territory. It's not that. It's not that your calm, you know, your 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 evil tendencies and habits might have got you into some difficult situations in life. Your the stance you take on life, which makes you act in in wicked ways, also is the same stance that will mean you experience reality painfully. But if you can just let it in, just let the experience in and just ponder it as simply what it is. It's just your experience of the human condition, your experience of, of, of Vedana in relation to the difficulty of being human. Something elevates the experience. So it doesn't wipe the karma away, but it transforms your experience of it. And you know, in confession, we're kind of opening ourselves to that. So this is why... And there's no time to read it. I, you know, in another world, I would have read you, uh, maybe I'm giving you a lucky escape, quite a few more verses out of Shantideva's text. He really does go to town. He really goes to town on reminding us how suddenly death can strike, you know, and how much, how much evil, how much wickedness, how much harm have we done through our intoxication with the ephemera of life ephemeral ephemeral cravings ephemeral relationships you know here we are on our deathbed alone with only our karma only our little puny store of merit and so on he doesn't let us off but remember he's just helping us to really make a full and complete confession not just make a confession but move into the mood of confession one we're in the presence of the Buddhas, we're, we're fully acknowledging the work to be done, but it's more than that. You know, we, we, we're kind of meeting that, you know, which could be painful and often is psychologically, but we're meeting it 
in the presence of someone, so to speak, who's just looking at it with compassion and encouragement and with ult an ultimately optimistic view of what we're capable of. But it can be a shock, you know, it can be a shock to read those, uh, those verses and, and, and to come across them. But um, I think Shantideva, you know, definitely feels he's doing us a favor. And we're probably going to experience that discomfort anyway, if we're making progress, if we're working on ourselves. So, you know, he's offering us a context in which we can, as, as fully and as wholeheartedly as possible, you know, experience those tendencies and those concerns about ourselves in a, a totally positive way. Something I, you know, I, I, I was never really going to do more than flag it, but um, back in uh, probably around 1979, 80, that sort of period, um, can't remember the date, um, Banti wrote his essay and published it, um, Buddhism and Blasphemy. And at the time, you know, the, we took it very seriously. He wanted us to. I mean, the, the, the thesis of, of, of the essay was that to be a Buddhist, you really absolutely have to um, exercise any hidden, latent um, God dwelling somewhere in the back of your, 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 your consciousness whether or not you had any kind of religious conditioning by virtue of growing up in a sort of Judeo-Christian um, conditioned society. You know, we, we have our issues of authority. We have our issues with ideas of evil and sin and so on, which are not fully appropriate or relevant in a Buddhist context. And he suggested that it's very unlikely that many Westerners are able to be Buddhists, if they haven't exercised um, the, the God within, you know, the judging, uh, condemning God within, and, and was encouraging in that essay, you know, various things, including what he called therapeutic blasphemy. And it's worth reading. I mean, it must be in one of the volumes of Complete Works, so I'm sure it's available now. But I've been surprised how many people I've spoken to who, when I've mentioned it, have never heard of it and certainly not read it. So, um, you know, I don't think it's out of date. You know, when, when I've talked about it, people say, oh, well, things have changed now, as if in 1970, we were all still God-fearing um, whatevers, um, which we weren't. Uh, I don't think times have changed that much. We are still you know, conditioned by our, our culture. So um, give that essay a look, because I think those questions which very understandably make people very hesitant, you know, around these words like evil and sin and so on that we encounter in, in this context. I think I think it'll help us to put you know, the, the idea of, of, of Buddhist confession in a new light. You know, just to say, I mean, I've been in some order contexts where confessing among friends and really exploring together what happened, you know what happened, why, you know, what, what mental states were there, you know, what did you learn from it, what reparations can you make, did you even need to confess? Many confession sessions ended up with the person realizing actually they had nothing to confess if they looked at natural rather than conventional morality. Um, you know, but, but that's, that's, that's for another time in, a, in, a, in, another, in a, another universe. But I just wanted to at least flag that, um, no, certainly pretty much since that uh, seminar and certainly since uh, Sanger actually gave his talk uh, about um, the spiritual significance of confession, it's been something that we've taken really seriously as a highly positive spiritual practice. And of course, you know, in line with um, the whole flow of, of, of this sevenfold puja, if we've traversed you know, all the stages, including the stage of, of confession, you know, if we have done it and if we've done it, you know, to some extent completely, we're kind of ready for this next step, the, re the rejoicing in merit. Um, let's just read 
Let's just read what Stephen Batchelet is. He's at hand, so I'll um it's like the if only psychologically the road is clear for us to step out of whatever reactive impulse has met our going for refuge, our, our attempt to commit ourselves to this ridiculously sublime ideal of bodhisattvahood, of, in, of complete and full enlightenment for the sake of all beings. Um, you know, we, we sort of helped ourselves with, with the Buddha's help uh, to move into you know, a, a more confident, more optimistic, more self-forgiving, more self-compassionate mood. And we are ready to return to our, our idealism. So gladly do I rejoice in the virtue that relieves the misery of all those in unfortunate states and that places those with suffering in happiness. I rejoice in the gathering of virtue that is the cause for the Arhat's awakening. I rejoice in the definite freedom of embodied creatures from the miseries of cyclic existence. I rejoice in the awakening of the Buddhas and also in the spiritual levels of their sons. And with gladness, I rejoice in the ocean of virtue from developing an awakening mind that wishes all beings to be happy as well in the deeds that bring them benefit. I don't know if you noticed um, that just as in the, the, verse on, uh, the verses of salutation, we kind of rode an elevator from you know, this realm of pure ideals down through you know, the, the, the fact that the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas have walked the earth, we, you, know, you can visit their tombs, down to the fact there are teachers, down to the fact that there are companions on, on, on the path that we can join. And here it's as if we ride an elevator up. You know, at first, gladly I rejoice in the virtue that relieves the misery. It's that, that those flashes of goodness. You know, there is virtue in the world. There's evil in us. There's evil in the world. There's, there's evil in and goodness in, in us. There's, there is that virtue that relieves the misery. It's out there. We don't know why. It's just there. We are capable of goodness. And that places those with suffering in happiness and then the gathering of virtues that, that is the cause of people to gain enlightenment, the, the virtue that, that brings about Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. And finally, it's uh, that ocean of virtue from developing an awakening mind that wishes all beings to be happy as well as in the deeds that bring them benefits. So he's taken us again all the way up from, if you like, those, those flashes of goodness to that realm of the Bodhicitta that field of potentiality that is entirely sort of transparent, personal, that's entirely altruistic, in which you know, our, our, our narrow self, um, our, our narrow self-interest can dissolve into an interest uh, in the welfare of all, or expand into an interest in the welfare of all. So it's a very important stage. Yes, it's a reminder to, to notice that there are people out there who impress us, who've made efforts, who, who've achieved something. And if we're lucky enough to know people like that, to have people like that in our lives, you know, I, I guess, um, you, know, I've been, you know, I've been involved now for almost 50 years. I think it is 50 years. Um, and I've seen people like, you know, Sabuti or Prakasha or Tejananda. I remember him showing up at a beginner's class I ran. You know, I, I joke with him that I taught him everything he knows, which is about as far from the truth as anyone could venture. Um, you know, it's, it's just been so wonderful, you know, to see friends of mine, you know, from days when we were just hanging out, you know, between acid trips, meeting this strange man, Sangharakshita, you know, and just seeing what some, some of my friends have made of themselves. You know, you... And of course, the thing about um, the rejoicing in merit is it kind of wouldn't be possible in the spiritual sphere unless we'd been through that confession stage, because we know how hard it is. We're in a position to admire the work these people have done because they're only human like us. 
They had their habits, they had their tendencies. We probably witnessed the results. And now we, we, we can see what they've made of themselves. Yeah, they might not be perfect, but we can see that they, they've changed. And you know, it, this, this is really important you know, to notice that you know, this, it's great to feel that respect and that, that love and that um, inspiration that we get from people we know who we've seen change or, or who embody something you know, just so obviously um, more developed, deeper, higher, more imaginative, whatever, whatever it is that um, at the moment is sort of floating our spiritual boat. It might be they're more creative at the moment, or it might be that they're more deep in to their meditation, or it may be that they're more courageous in the risks they're taking. But, you know, something about them, you know, it really impresses us. And how wonderful to allow ourselves to be impressed and not to feel competitive. I can remember in the early days how... Um, We'd meet, meet up on a Thursday or a Friday or whenever it was, and then you'd overhear conversations or participate in them where somebody would say, oh, you know, last night, you know, I was meditating, but after three hours, it got, you know, it was just so much richer. And someone said, oh, I know what you mean. You know, it was the fourth hour for me. You know, this kind of macho talk, men and women, you know, that how long they'd meditated and how far they'd got, you know, now just, just being able to not be competitive, but to really respect and enjoy seeing seeing people. I'm watching you know, my very good friend Damarati on online this morning. I just what a wonderful, you know, just what a wonderful display of lucidity and clarity and poise he displays. You know, teaching you know, the Anapanasati and Satipatthana sutras. It's just an absolute joy to see it. I mean, it can be an absolute pain in the ass in other ways, but really, it's just so delightful and so nourishing, you know, to, to see the, you know, the, the progress and the way people have, have developed. And, and you see it in the way they embody. It may or may not be that they're articulate or whatever, but you can tell when somebody embodies something. So a very, very important and valuable emotion to, to, to be led into by Shanti Deva, and of course, if we are committed to this life, and if we are aware, thanks to our, our dunking in the nature of the project and the challenge, and maybe you know, the, the burden of the project that, that we're facing, but if we're aware that there are others out there who have attained something, who, you know, who can embody something for us, who can inspire us, who can challenge us, who can teach us, well, why wouldn't we ask for their help why wouldn't we make ourselves available to them there's a there's a lovely story in the Pali canon um i don't know why it's one of my favorite stories it's a story in the mahaparinibbana sutta where the buddha says to ananda you know um people who've attained the powers that I've attained on my way to enlightenment. You know, the Buddha had picked up powers inevitably as he, as he headed towards insight, but with dhyana practice comes, you know, with certain powers like telepathy and so on. Um, and uh, he said, if you have the kind of powers I've developed, you can be capable of um, lengthening the span of your life for an entire kalpa. And Ananda sort of says, oh, yeah. There's a long pause. And the Buddha says, yes, yes. You know, if, if, if you've attained the kind of powers I've got, you can, you can live for thousands of years. And Ananda says, oh, yeah, oh, right, yeah, yeah, whatever. And the Buddha says it a third time. And Ananda, Ananda um, again, just fails to get it. He doesn't take the hint. And so the Buddha has a chat with, with Mara and says, don't worry, Mara, I've decided I'm, I'm going to die. And Arnand has missed the chance. And, and later on, when Arnand realizes he's happened, you know, that that's happened, the Buddha really doesn't let him off. He gives him a real hard time. I said, I told you, I gave you the opportunity, but you didn't ask. So in the same way, um, you know, we... We beg, we supplicate, you know, we entreat, you know, entreat and supplication is the heading of, of, of those verses in our sevenfold puja. Let's just see how, um, how um, 
Stephen translates this. With folded hands, I beseech the Buddhas in all directions to shine the lamp of the Dharma for all bewildered in misery's gloom. With folded hands, I beseech the conquerors who wish to pass away to please remain for countless aeons and not to leave the world in darkness. It, in a way, it doesn't matter how the Buddhas answer us. You know, the, what's crucial is that we are contacting the mood of receptivity, of active, active receptivity. We want to learn. We want to be taught. We want, we want guidance. Um, we want to, you know, if, if only to learn from our mistakes, that that's the attitude that we bring to our practice, one of wanting to learn, wanting to go further, and yet to, to be really willing to receive whatever help, whatever inspiration we, we, we can get from, from others. It's interesting. Um, there's, there's the story of Bahia of the Bart Dharma, who's well known, very popular, because you know, the, the teaching the Buddha gives him is this, this one of in the seeing, just the seen, in the hearing, just the heard, and so on. It's, you know, it's a very profound, well, it's, it's mindfulness and beyond mindfulness, because it's, it's a teaching about non-self as well. But what's interesting is that, um, you know, as, as, as most of you probably know, after his encounter with the Buddha, Bahia uh, almost immediately is killed by, by a, 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 a cow, gored you know, go and trampled to death by a cow. When talking about Bahia, the Buddha says, he did not vex me with his Dharma questions. And yet a big part of the story is how Bahia turns up in the middle of the Buddha's arms round and, and three times has to try and persuade the Buddha to stop what he's doing and give him a teaching. And yet the sutta says, has the Buddha saying, he did not vex me, you know, with, 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 his, with his Dharma talk. You know, he didn't vex the Buddha because yes, he really wanted a teaching and he really received it. He really was truly receptive. So for the Buddha, it wasn't a waste of time. It wasn't a drain on his energy. It, it, it's very interesting that in 1973, Sangha went on a almost a year's sabbatical. And he wrote a, a letter you know, to, to those of us who were involved at the time. And he's saying, well, people keep asking me why, I'm, why I've left you um, for, for a year. And he said, it's because I just want to focus on my practice, write my book, and so on. He said, but it has to be said that um, I don't think it's been helpful to be treated as a piece of spiritual, um, something like a piece of spiritual clockwork. You know, people just coming to him with their questions and uh, just expecting him to have the answers. I think he, he, he was, um, it wasn't just, you know, to do with the, our questions being bad or not very well phrased, which he picked up in 1972. It was more that he just really wondered how much we meant it. You know, we'd come to him with questions. Yeah, but did we really mean it? Did we really want to know how many of us really cared? How many of us were really on the bus and, and wanting the guidance that he was capable of giving? So, you know, the, the, this mood of, of receptivity of treating supplication is, is really positive and it's kind of climactic because it's a little bit like the Buddha's last words, you know, with mindfulness strive on, you know, with, if, you, if you've tra traversed all these stages up to this point and you are still eager to be taught, you don't think you've done it just because you've got the ideals, just because you've committed yourself, just because you've seen yourself a bit more clearly, and just because you're back in touch with, 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 with uh, the, the spirit of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, you, know, you haven't really done it. You know you've got a lot to learn, and, and you, you know, you're sufficiently grounded in your, in, your, in, in your questioning, in your pursuit, in your quest, you know, to mean that you will make progress. So in a sense, you've... You've kind of done all the, the preparatory work. And so the culmination comes in the seventh mood. Um, 
and what Shanti Deva does. And there's, you know, luckily there's not too much I need to say about it, but what Shanti Deva does is says, okay, you've brought yourself this far. Now, to conclude this practice, I'm going to invite you to just try out being a bodhisattva. I'm just going to let you connect with what might it be like. What kind of a mind would you have? What kind of an aspiration might you have if you were a bodhisattva? It is interesting that the entreaty and supplication, and it's worth noticing that even though it's me beseeching with folded hands, I beseech the conquerors who wish to pass away to please remain for countless aeons and not to leave the world in darkness. It's not and not to leave me in darkness. So already your mind is beginning to expand. You're beginning to think beyond yourself, to aspire and wish beyond your own your personal need for enlightenment. And so it's as if Shanti Deva is saying, okay, the next step is to, if, if you're beginning to feel the first tremors of, of bodhicitta, of, of, of a bodhisattva spirit, let's see how it feels to put on the costume, to put on the crown of a bodhisattva. And so what I'm going to do is to read uh, some of these verses that Shantideva concludes his puja with. And they're just, they're just gorgeous. Yeah. So uh, just again, just allow yourself to sink into them. And, you know, because this has been quite discursive, it's not as if we really have performed the puja as prescribed, but just see if these words reach you. Thus, by the virtue collected through all that I have done, may the pain of every living creature be completely cleared away. May I be a doctor and the medicine, and may I be the nurse for all sick beings in the world until everyone is healed. May a rain of food and drink descend to clear away the pain of thirst and hunger, and during the aeon of famine, may I myself change into food and drink. May I become an inexhaustible treasure for those who are poor and destitute. May I turn into all things they could need, and may these be placed close beside them. Without any sense of loss, I shall give up my body and enjoyment, as well as all my virtues of the three times, for the sake of benefiting all. By giving up all, Sorrow is transcended, and my mind will realize the sorrowless state. It's therefore best that I now give everything to all beings in the same way as I shall at death. Having given this body up for the pleasure of all living beings, by killing, abusing, and beating it, may they always do as they please. Although they may play with my body and make it a source of jest and blame, because I've given it up to them, what is the use of holding it dear? Therefore, I shall let them do anything to it that does not cause them any harm. And when anyone encounters me, may it never be meaningless for him. May I be a protector for those without one, a guide for all travellers on the way. May I be a bridge, a boat and a ship for all who wish to cross the water. May I be an island for those who seek one and a lamp for those desiring light. May I be a bed for all who wish to rest and a slave for all who want a slave. May I be a wishing jewel, a magic vase, powerful mantras and great medicine. May I become a wish-fulfilling tree and a cow of plenty for the world. Just like space and the great elements such as earth, may I always support the life of all the boundless creatures. Until they pass away from pain, may I also be the source of life for all the realms of varied beings that reach unto the ends of space. 
just as the previous Sugatas gave birth to an awakening mind, and just as they successively dwelt in the Bodhisattva practices, likewise, for the sake of all that lives, do I give birth to an awakening mind, and likewise shall I too successively follow the practices. In order to further increase it from now on, those with discernment who have lucidly seized an awakening mind in this way should highly praise it in the following manner. Today, my life has borne fruit. Having well obtained this human existence, I've been born in the family of Buddha and am now one of Buddha's heirs. Thus, whatever actions I do from now on must be in accord with the family. Never shall I disgrace or pollute this noble and unsullied race. Just like a blind man discovering a jewel in a heap of rubbish, likewise, by some coincidence, an awakening mind has been born within me. It is the supreme ambrosia that overcomes the sovereignty of death. It is the inexhaustible treasure that eliminates all poverty in the world. It is the supreme medicine that quells the world's disease. It is the tree that shelters all beings, wandering and tired on the path of conditioned existence. It is the universal bridge that leads to freedom from unhappy states of birth. It is the dawning moon of the mind that dispels the torment of disturbing conceptions. It is the great sun that finally removes the misty ignorance of the world. It is the quintessential butter from the churning of the milk of Dharma. For all those guests traveling on the path of conditioned existence who wish to satisfy the bounties of happiness, to experience the bounties of happiness, this will satisfy them with joy and actually place them in supreme bliss. Today, in the presence of all the protectors, I invite the world to be guests at a festival of temporary and ultimate delight. May gods, anti-gods, and all be joyful. Take that to be your dramatic ending, Nagabodhi. <laughs> well, I think it has to be, doesn't it? We're a couple of minutes over. Um, like yeah. I say, in an ideal world, we'd have longer, and maybe we should have planned for longer. But well, I hope um, I hope you've got well a taste, or more than a taste, and a sense of how you can enjoy not just a, a, a puja, a tree and a puja, but uh, returning to Shanti Deva's uh, text itself. There are shortened versions of Shantideva's text, and they're around in the uh, Bodhicharya Vatara Puja, which I think Suvadra might have composed many years ago. You know, you can have a look at that. Or even if you just do the sevenfold puja as, as we do it in our world, but introduce pauses so that you can have the time to just connect with that mood before moving on. Even that can make a really different, uh, you know, make, make make the experience different for you and connect you with something of the depth of the journey that Shantideva, you know, is trying to take you on <coughs> in his um, in his uh, chapters. So thank you for uh, for being here. I'm sorry that uh, you know that we have run out of time, and I know there will be people needing to go. So. I think this is where we have to draw a line, but but thanks for being here. And yes, there will be more sessions uh, uh, over time. There's no regularity, but over the coming period of time, uh, there will be more of these in, uh, encounters with the Bodhicharavatara, with me and, and others. So more of that in due course. Thanks for coming. <laughs>